Uh, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this seminar. And thank uh, to all three of you, Alina, uh, Michael and Philippe, for organizing this very, this wonderful seminar during uh, this pandemic. So I'll speak about uh, some work that has been ongoing for a long time. Uh, let's see. So here is the very basic setup. So um, we choose an integer n uniformly at random, and then um, we want to see what we can say about its multiplicative structure. And more precisely, we would like to say maybe things about the statistics of its prime factors uh, or about uh, the statistics of its divisors. Okay, so let me, in the beginning, I'll just give a brief uh, history of the, a brief account of the history of the first question, which is very well understood. And then I'll pass to the second question, which is the main topic of this uh, talk. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let me write um, P1 up to PK of N for the prime factors of N, where K is, we, we write omega N for this function, the number of prime factors. So we know from the time of Hardy Ramanujan that for, if for almost all n, meaning that exceptional set is, uh, has cardinality little log of x, omega n is very close to log log of x. But a lot more is known, um, starting with work of Landau and then Selberg and Delange. Uh, we know the, the point-wise distribution of omega n, how frequently omega n takes the value, let's say, k. Um, and this is some, some perturbed version of the Poisson distribution uh, with parameter log log x. So it does concentrate. So this is a, right, so it concentrates a log 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 x, of course, like a Poisson distribution. So this is an improvement of the first result. Um, but we know uh, a lot more. We know that if we fix some uh, disjoint sets, I1, let's say up to I m, that satisfy various technical conditions that I'm not gonna mention, then if you look at how many primes, um, prime factors n has from each of these intervals i j, then these are random variables that are roughly um, independent of each other and Poisson distributed with parameters lambda j, which is the sum of the reciprocals of the primes in each of the sets i j. Okay, so I'm not 100% sure who to attribute this result to. Um, this seems to be known in some version to Billings Clay, and there is recent work of it in uniform versions of it due to Tenenbaum and Ford in recent years. Um, if you look at the right, so we can also look at um, order the order the prime factors, then look at the small at the intermediate range of one and the intermediate intermediate one. So I start from the j and end at the k minus j. And if I look at this vector and I want to ask very statistical questions about this, their joint distribution, then um, I can reduce this question to asking questions about the distribution of uh, order statistics. So the middle part of uh, K ordered uh, vectors. So they do behave basically like uniform random variables. Uh, and in particular, the jth, we know that the jth uh, divisor, prime divisor is approximately equal to J for most N. Uh, whereas if I want to look at the big prime factors, they behave quite differently. They're much more irregular. And uh, the right scale to look at this is the logarithmic scale. So if I normalize by log n, the logs of the top j prime factors, then this look like the first j entries of a Poisson Dirichlet distribution. Okay, so all kinds of questions you want to ask about the statistics of prime factors, they're very well understood. And uh, we have quite satisfactory answers to them. Uh, this is really not the case if I um, look at the distribution of divisors. Uh, this theory is, is far from being complete. And um, the two guiding problems of the subject have been two questions of Erdos. Uh, so they're very simple to state. <clears throat> so the first one uh, asks um, about the local distribution of divisors. Is it true that if you randomly pick an integer n, that there are two divisors that are close together, um, were close in, if you take logarithms. So if you take logs, then they, are, they both lie within log two or big O one of each other. So that's the first question. And um, the second question is how many integers there are, uh, how many distinct integers, I should say, appear in, if you take the n by n multiplication table. Okay, so you, you consider it, of course, 
some integers will appear in many in many ways remove all the multiples how many do you have uh, left and um, the motivation maybe for the first one is to really start understanding more local properties of the sequence of divisors because if you look at it from a more global point of view we do have some some rough estimates um, we do know that if i look at the log log of the j divisor then this is roughly equal to log j over log two uh, and then naively uh, if i take this very literally i might then just take i might, I might then think that if i look at the log of consecutive uh, ratios then this actually tends to infinity but Erdo said that this is very a very false, uh, a, a very misleading mod, uh, thing to use as a model. Uh, and uh, actually, the, he, he conjectured that the divisors really get tend to form very large clusters. Uh, so he thought that the answer to this question is yes. <laughs> and, and in the second problem, um, Okay, there's this high school, uh, there is this elementary school way of uh, stating it, but there is also a more, uh, maybe a, gen a, gen a more general way of stating it and asking um, if I give you a, a divide, uh, sorry, an interval yz, how many integers up to x have a divisor from this interval? Okay, which is a very natural question that might appear in all sorts of uh, contexts of other problems. And if you take x of the integers up to n squared, then to appear in the n by n multiplication table basically means you have two factors roughly of size n. So it's roughly the second question, the more general question captures the first question if you take uh, y and z to be, let's say, a dyadic interval, um, where y is n over 2 and z is n. <clears throat> okay, so these are the two problems that um, have inspired most of the work uh, in the subject. And uh, there, and I will study this, I will discuss these problems and also two generalizations of them. So the generalization of the first one is um, we don't just ask for two divisors, but we ask for uh, many divisors that are all packed together in a, in a small logarithmic interval. So maybe I think of k as a function of x, and I want to ask then, um, is it true that for most integers n up to x that the, I can find k divisors that are close together in this dyadic way? And um, <clears throat> this question can be reformulated in terms of uh, the delta function introduced by Hooley. Uh, so the delta function counts the maximal concentration of divisors in a dyadic interval. So you, you, you count how many divisors you can find between y and 2y, and then you take the maximum over all these. So basically, the, the first problem A asks how big is delta n. So this A star asks how big is delta n for a typical um, integer n. It's equivalent. And uh, who introduced this function? When he introduced his function in the paper, he introduced his function. He studied the average this uh, the average value of it, delta n. And uh, he and the, his motivation for doing so is actually very different. Um, he, he noticed that if he had um, some good estimates for this sum, he could then um, uh, deduce some corollaries about the various Diffanian problems, um, about counting, to, counting solutions to equations and inequalities. Uh, so it's uh, quite an original idea that he had. And um, uh, right, so here he studied his average. We, we in this talk, I will be interested in the almost surely in the, in the almost sure behavior of delta n. And the generalization of the other of the multiplication table problem is going to be in k dimensions. So again, here we have k divisors that we want to pack together. Uh, here we have k divisors, well, a product of uh, we want to write n as the product of k things. And um, again, I can think of this problem in a more general point, from a more general point of view. Um, if I give you some intervals y j uh, z j, then um, the question is how many is this n I can factor uh, with each of the factors lying in these uh, intervals. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna then first speak about the first problem of Erdos. Okay, so 
in all these problems, um, uh, there is this very common uh, principle that I hope will come across uh, uh, from uh, my talk. So what you do is that, so the right scale to look at all these problems is the logarithmic one. And um, uh, so what we do is that we, so what we wanna find in Erdos's problem is we wanna find two divisors uh, whose ratio is very close to zero, which is very close to one, sorry. So equivalently, it's logarith the logarithm of the ratios will be very close to zero. So let me consider um, these quantities, uh, log of d prime over d for all possible pairs of divisors. And let me put a box of length of diameter, sorry, radius log two around them. And then uh, you can check that the condition, there are um, distinct d d prime such that, um, Right, I should have said that D and D prime here are different from each other. Um, there are D and D prime um, that line this dyadic interval, if and only if this set R of N of these ratios, log, log of the ratios contains zero. <clears throat> okay, so now we uh, can think of this uh, in a more geometric way. And uh, when I, uh, the, the heuristic is that as long as R of N is big enough, um, as long as R of N covers pretty much um, as much as it can cover, then zero will lie in it, or actually any given point will lie in it with high probability. Um, okay, so what are the kind of conditions we have on R of N? So notice that all, of course, all of the points here, D prime over D are between uh, N and one over N. So naturally R of N, um, is contained in the interval minus log 2n and log 2n. So I, I view this as a geometric constraint on uh, how big R of n can be. And there is also a combinatorial constraint on R of n, how big R of n can be. And this just comes from how many um, of these pairs I have, uh, these distinct fractions I have, d prime over d. And the number of distinct fractions that you have is not four to the omega n, but three to the omega n. And because you have to delete common common prime factors, okay. So just think of n being square three. Then for every prime, I have three options: either I put it in the denominator or in the numerator, or I don't put it anywhere. So you have about three to the omega n uh, possibilities for uh, these intervals. So if I want to cover, so so the so then the the question is what kind? What do I need for? Um, for my, to have enough many intervals um, in order to have a chance to cover all of this interval or a big portion of this interval, well, I would need um, uh, that the combinatorial count is bigger than the geometric count. And uh, here, because omega n is a typical integer and so has about log log n prime factors, three to the omega n is about log n to the log three. And because log three is bigger than one, uh, I have a lot more intervals than I have um, than the measure of the interval I'm trying to, cover, to cover. So unless there is some crazy conspiracy between these intervals, um, I ought to be able to cover really quite well um, this interval minus log two and up to log two n. And um, then there is a side argument to show that if this happens, uh, sorry, this would, be this would have been measure of R of N. If this does happen, if the measure of R of N is really as big, then we can locate um, a ratio close to zero because we want the ratio to be at a specific um, close to one should have been here again, or take the logarithm and then it's close to zero. Uh, because really we want the, the ratio to be close to, the log of the ratio to be close to zero. We want zero to be in R of N and there is, a, method for doing this, which is to use some additional primes to sort of shift your, uh, the interval that you have around using some additional primes, big primes here, and sort of go from covering well, covering sort of well, but maybe with some holes, minus log n to log n, to really covering any given point you like. So this is quite technical, so I don't wanna really discuss this, uh, but this is basically in a nutshell, the. Um, argument of Meyer and Tenenbaum from 1984. 
And uh, what Meyer and Tenenbaum notice here, uh, they proved they proved Erdos conjecture, and actually they proved a lot more. Uh, so notice here that I have a lot of room between uh, log n to the log three and log n. So and indeed, Meyer and Tenenbaum showed that. Um, you can even shrink the, the diameters of these uh, intervals here and uh, still get uh, a large measure because you have so many intervals. And the, the conclusion is that for almost all n, there are, divide, there are distinct divisors dd d, d prime whose ratio is basically smaller than one plus uh, log n to this negative power here. So it gets really close to one. <clears throat> and this is the heuristic reason of this is a very, a very rough explanation of why this ought to be true. So now let me um, switch gears and speak about the other problem of Erdos. Um, uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, before I speak about the other, I'm, I'm gonna speak a little bit about uh, A star, uh, which is the generalization of the problem of Erdos uh, about the holy delta function. Um, so, this, because this argument has two, has a really a lot of room um, between log n and log n to the log three, there are two directions towards one, uh, towards which one can uh, improve it. One is this one that I mentioned already, which is to get divisors in even shorter intervals. But Meyer and Tenenbaum noticed that there is also a different way uh, one can modify this argument uh, by being uh, more clever. And they used it. They used this other way to to prove to prove that uh, there actually you can really cluster lots and lots of divisors in a small interval. Um, okay, so recall this is the notation for R of n. And now let me fix two parameters y and z, and consider um, what the portion of my uh, integer n that consists of these primes um, prime factors between y and z. And let me assume that everything is square free, so I don't really care about. Uh, squares and things like that. Okay, so <clears throat> now I will just try. I will try to construct uh, two divisors that are close together using this restricted set of prime factors uh, between y and z. And uh, now I have two competing constraints. The first one is again a geometric one. Um, that all of the divisors of um, all of the divisors are of course at most n, y, z, and because this is a uh, this is a z smooth integer, most of the time it's gonna be z to the big O one. So its log is gonna be bounded by constant times log z. Uh, so this means that this interval, uh, this, sorry, this set R of uh, R of n, y, z really basically lies between minus constant log z and constant log z for a tip for most n with, with very high probability. So this is a geometric constraint. And the combinatorial constraint is how many distinct intervals I have. And I have three to the number of prime factors of uh, n between y and z. And for a typical integer, um, you expect that the number of prime factors between y and z is, three, is the double logarithmic length of the interval. So it should be log of, log of z over log y. OK, so what is it that you need? You need, uh, in order to ensure in order to have any chance of what you would like is to have enough uh, many intervals so that um, you have a chance of covering uh, this um, big interval here. Enough many little intervals to, to have a big chance of covering a good portion of the big interval. So you would need uh, this bound here to be bigger than log z. And this happens when uh, log of z is bigger than this power of log of y. Um, in this case, we have enough many intervals to have a good chance to uh, really cover all of the interval, a big portion of the interval. And then we can find, then this means that we have a really good chance of finding a ratio uh, d prime over d that is close to one. Again, I made this mistake. Um, with all the prime factors of this ratio lying between y and z. Okay, that's great because now uh, I can, iterate this process and use not just one interval, but J distinct intervals. And then for each interval, I get two, two divisors, 
but all these divisors are completely co-primed. So then I can take any possible products of these um, divisors to actually get two to the J divisors of N that are close together. So there is this tensor product trick uh, that gets you from two to many. Um, and using this argument, my Tenenbaum showed that the Hooli delta function is, gets quite big. Uh, so log log n to this, cert, to this power uh, h1, where h1 is the, uh, is the ratio of log of two over, this, of log of, over log of this exponent. So you do the math, this is what you get. <clears throat> uh, and so it's a positive power, it's about 0 0.28754. Okay, so uh, all right. So this is what I'll say for now about the first uh, about problems A and A star. Let me now discuss uh, problems uh, B and B star. Um, so here we're trying to find um, integers with a divisor in some interval. Let's say I, I, I will focus on the dyadic case where my divisors are between y and two y. Um, so, right, so again, in this case, what I'm gonna look is, I'm gonna look at logarithmic scale and I'm gonna um, look at all of the log d's and then put an interval of uh, length log two around uh, log d. Well, it's an asymmetric interval in this case, that's just a technicality. And what I want uh, is uh, that this, uh, then the union of these intervals contain a specific number, which is log of y. So you can see it's very similar in spirit to the previous situation. Um, and <clears throat> here is the heuristic. Um, the heuristic is that uh, the probability that this set L of N contains uh, log Y should basically be um, the, the average of its measure divided by log X because L of N here lives in, in an interval of long, length log x. Um, so if I view this as somehow a random set, then this is uh, what would expect. Uh, this is quite a reasonable guess. And um, this, can, this question mark can indeed uh, be justified uh, and made rigorous. Uh, and then there is a much, there is a leap of faith where I have these two question marks here where that says that maybe, um, this measure looks like uh, the minimum between tau of n and log of x. Okay, so tau of n is the number of the divisors. I'm used this, I use this uh, notation <clears throat> uh, for the number for the divisor function. Um, and again, this represents this this minimum here represents the two type of constraints one has. Uh, like in this case, we had a geometric constraint and a combinatorial constraint. And in this case too, we have a geometric constraint log of x, which is that um, L of n is a subset of one comma log x. And a combinatorial constraint, which is that L of n is the union of tau of n intervals of bounded length. Okay, so uh, it's the balance between these two constraints that is important. And um, uh, right, so if you, so it's possible now, uh, this is quite easy to analyze and um, to show that actually um, all the action happens when tau of n has size log of x, meaning you have exactly as many intervals to, to really cover just um, exactly as many you, you would need to cover all of your interval and no more than that no, and no less either. Okay, so really the crucial, this, is, this goes back to the work of Erdos and then improved by Tenenbaum in the eighties, uh, that you need to have that the crucial range of n's to look at is when n is has log log x over log two plus big O one prime factors, so that the two constraints balance each other. And um, this leads to at least when y is a power of x, uh, to to showing that this prob to guessing that this probability uh, that there is a divisor between y and two y is about this quantity. Okay, it is some quantity, it's not so, um, it's just a calculation of this, um, of this right-hand side that can be done uh, quite easily. 
Again, delta is this um, uh, constant that uh, is quite well known, uh, it appears a lot <coughs> in, the, in this theory. And um, uh, Ford, uh, in his work, um, for, uh, worked on this problem and showed that actually that uh, this um, heuristic, this double question mark, the double question mark is not really that accurate. Uh, in order to really make it accurate, um, so he, sh he showed that there are other constraints on um, that one needs to uh, take a into account of. Uh, you cannot have too many small prime factors at any scale. So basically, at any scale, up to any scale y, you have to have at most the right, at, at most log log y over log two uh, prime divisors. And uh, in order to have uh, in order to have big measure here, in order for this measure to be as big as it can be, which is log of x, and um, uh, the probability of this, this is not a very frequent event. It only happens with probability about one over log log x. And um, uh, uh, sorry, this should, this I should have used a different variable here. This should have been maybe a t uh, for all t up to x, not the y is fixed. Uh, so Ford proved that, um, uh, then you see this new idea to prove that the probability that you have a device between y and 2y is uh, uh, about this naive guess, but uh, then when you also add um, uh, an extra log log y in the denominator. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So now let us study now the higher dimensional analog of this problem. Um, okay. So here we want to understand the probability uh, that you have a factorization into k factors, and uh, Really, you just need to fix the k minus the size of the k minus one factors and the size of your integer, and then the last one will also be fixed. Uh, so, it's based. This question is basically equivalent to understanding what is the probability that if you pick an n up to x, there is a product of there is a product of k minus one integers that divide it, and each of these k minus one integers is in some dyadic interval. And uh, like in the previous case, I should look, I should, I, should, I should come up with an appropriate set. I need to understand this distribution. Um, and this set in this case is this LK of N set. Uh, right, so <clears throat> what do you do? You look at, now you have, this, is, this, this now lives in K minus one dimensions. So for each uh, such k minus one tuple, um, you put a box of um, you put a, you consider a cube of length uh, side length one or log two around it, and you take the union of all such cubes. And uh, of course, because the di's um, you want the di's to be less than yi, um, we should be assuming that the di's are yi smooth. <clears throat> Uh, you, you don't really want to consider all of these cubes, but only the uh, relevant ones. And th the question is now, what are the kind of constraints one has um, on this set? And um, this should give us some sort of heuristic <clears throat> guess of what, how big this probability should be. An analogy with the previous uh, setup. So, Okay, so let me write omega i for the number of prime factors of n um, between yi minus one and yi, when, where y zero is just one. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> right, so I have only the prime factors up to yk are important, so I partition them in, into k intervals according to which thresholds they have surpassed or not. Um, and then there are two competing bounds on LK of N. One is the geometric bound, which is just, uh, well, the DIs here are YI smooth. Uh, so their logs would, re would really be um, as big as uh, log YI at most. So I just, I take the product of all this because, right? So this dimension is bounded by log Y1, the second dimension by log Y2, etc. And then I just count the other competing constraint is a combinatorial constraint that counts how many um, pairs I have. Uh, so how many intervals I have. 
And uh, this is it's an easy exercise to, to show that the, the total count of, um, uh, of tuples here is given by this product. Okay, so you get k to the omega one, then k minus one to the omega two of n, et cetera. <clears throat> okay, so, and the heuristic, if I, um, okay, so even though the, the, this argument, this more naive heuristic was not quite correct, it still came really close to the truth, at least as, as far as the correct power of log x is concerned. So let's just ignore powers of log log x for now. And um, then let us use the previous heuristic to guess um, the right answer for uh, this probability. So if I use the previous heuristic, then what I should do, I should then look at, um, Right, so I should look when these constraints uh, completely balance each other. So I look at um, uh, all the possible um, choices for the cardinalities omega i n, um, such that this product here is basically equal to this product up to a constant. Uh, and then I look how many integers, what is the proportion of integers such that omega i of n is equal to m i. Uh, so the proportion of such integers uh, is roughly given by uh, k minus one independent Poisson distributions that have parameters lambda i, as I explained in the beginning, in the first, in the second slide of the talk. So um, this is the expected proportion of integers with uh, such that omega i of n is m i, and then I just uh, take all possible pos all possible combinations and maximize over all of them. Okay, so this is a, a guess one, one more. Talk the computer to do something. This is a guess one might make um, on this um, probability using this sort of um, interplay between combinatorial and geometric conditions. Uh, and then understanding this maximum is then just a calculus exercise. Uh, it can be done using. Uh, for example, using Lagrange, Lagrange multipliers, you can, uh, using Stirling's formula, Lagrange multipliers, you can calculate this maximum. Okay, um, all right. So is this actually true? Well, this, um, <clears throat> so back in 2014, I showed that if K is uh, less than six, uh, up to six, then this heuristic is true. Um, so this actually, uh, it's true in an, in a, in a strong sense, in the sense that one can get the exact order, like in, Ford, uh, in Ford's theorem, if one considers additional constraints like of this form, which are too complicated to state now. So I'll just skip all of that. Uh, but if k is at least seven, uh, then things change. So uh, in general, um, you do have this kind of naive heuristic being true uh, if all the side lengths are sort of the same. Um, so you have a little bit of room here. You can go, um, you can let the biggest one being uh, log y, log of the smallest one to the one plus epsilon for some epsilon. Uh, but really this is best possible, in a sense is best possible. And here is a particular case when, it, when um, this heuristic fails. Take k to be seven and take the first five thresholds to be all the same and take the sixth one free and bigger. Uh, then there is some particular constant that we can calculate to arbitrary precision. These are a few of its digits, uh, such that um, if the log of y6 is smaller than log y1 to the c, minus a little bit more, then this naive heuristic is true. But if the sixth dimension is much big, is really much bigger than the other ones, then the, the situation changes. And this really makes sense because um, now you really start considering a multiplication table where all the dimensions are really tiny and there is really one that is much bigger one. And um, right, so one should really, when considering this k-dimensional multiplication table problem, one should think about higher dimensional, sorry, lower dimensional possible constraints that come from these other two configurations that are constraints that are both that are somehow a, a hybrid version of this geometric and combinatorial constraints I mentioned before. 
So here is an example in when K7, uh, right? So let's factor. Let's factor our integer n into seven prime factors according, right? So this ni is whatever is between yi minus one and yi. Um, and then my L7, um, I can, this would have been di divides n1 up to ni. I'm sorry about this because it's yi smooth. Uh, and then what I can do is that I can fix um, these five dimensions. Um, just fix the, all the, these di's and look at the last one, last dimension, which is really this um, looking at lower dimensional constraints and uh, just take a, a union bound in this fashion. And this would give me some other possible constraint on the measure on how big the measure of L7 can be, uh, right? So it's gonna be the measure of all these D6, or the union of all these D6s, which is captured by the measure of some two dimensional object or one dimensional because we're always one dimension down uh, times then some of the possible all the, all the possible uh, d1 up to d5. Okay, so you have all these other constraints to fight with, and this is the uh, important one uh, in this particular example <clears throat> that comes into play and uh, ruins the the, heurist, the the most naive heuristic. Okay, so this kind of lower dimensional constraints. Um, really come into play and one has to consider them quite carefully when uh, dealing with, when one starts going into higher dimensional uh, multiplication table, uh, higher dimensional theory of divisors. Okay, so now let me uh, finally switch gears and speak a bit about um, the A star problem, the generalization of the first problem of Erdos and about Hooli Delta's function, which is a recent work um, that I did with uh, David Ford and Ben Green. Okay, so recall, uh, so, um, right. So here's how one can improve the original uh, 1984 Meyer Tenenbaum result. Uh, so first of all, let us recall uh, their argument. So what did they do uh, to produce a large value of Delta N uh, to pack many divisors close together? they used J disjoint intervals, yj, zj, uh, for which there are, such so that for each interval, we can find a distinct two distinct divisors, dj, dj prime, um, such that they're close together, and such that they only consist of primes from this given interval, right? And then I can take every possible product and construct two to the j prime, um, oops, uh, divisors close together, not prime factors. <clears throat> okay, so this is the original 1984 Martin Tenenbaum result. Then in 2009, they revisited um, their the result, and um, they said, "Well, wait a minute. Uh, this is not really an optimal construction because uh, after I've used all the primes in Y1, uh, Z1 to find D1, D2, then when I'm trying to construct the prime, the divisors D2, D2 prime." then, okay, I can use all the primes in Y2, Z2, but there are also some remaining primes in Y1, Z1 uh, that maybe I, I could use as well. And um, uh, then, then I have more primes to work with. So maybe I can construct, maybe I can, uh, maybe I can construct these divisors in a more efficient way. And indeed they showed that this new idea leads to an improved lower bound on Hooley's Delta function, almost surely. The previous lower bound was 0 0.28 something. So this is 0 0.33 something. Okay, and in uh, recent work with uh, Ford and Green, we took a um, we took a different point of view. <coughs> so Excuse me, you, well, we yes. have a question in the chat by Christian yes. Tuffula. Maybe Christian, maybe you just want to unmute and ask directly. So the question is, why does it break exactly at seven? I think it refers to the previous slide. Uh, yes, so it's because this type of lower dimensional constraints don't, are not important uh, before. They don't give um, uh, this that kind of upper bound 
uh, is bigger than log of uh, than the trivial ones, than log of y one up to log of y six. Uh, sorry, the uh, the trivial. This is the bound one which is comparing to always the total uh, volume. It's the product of the log y i's, and you have all this other. Um, and you optimize, you, you find whatever the optimal uh, situation is, and um, it turns out that these kind of upper bounds are not, not relevant in this case. They give you even bigger, uh, they don't restrict the measure <clears throat> to be less than this product. I see, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, um, right, so, Right, so I explained to you how Meyer Tenenbaum in 2009 improved the previous result. And now I'll explain how uh, in recent work, we improved um, uh, the 2009 result using a different idea. Okay, so um, instead of just, okay, so this is much closer in spirit in a sense to the first uh, proof, uh, to the first argument. Uh, so instead of just, um, of finding these joint intervals that contain two distinct prime uh, factors, uh, sorry, divisors, why not try and find um, uh, J disjoint intervals, Y, J, Z, J, such that um, in each one you can find K distinct divisors for some fixed K that is bigger than two. Okay, let's try and play this game. Um, and let's see what it gives. Uh, and uh, what it ended up giving um, is a better lower bound on delta n, uh, which is this H3, which is a little bit bigger than 3, 5, 3, 3, 2, 2, uh, which is li a little bit bigger than the previous bound of Meyer Tenenbaum. And uh, it does have an explicit um, description, well, a precise definition, not explicit, but that, um, but that I'm going to give towards the end, but, but it's really complicated, so I'm skipping it for now. All right, so um, let me try and explain um, how, uh, so the key would be then, uh, how can one modify the construction of the Meyer Tenenbaum, of Meyer Tenenbaum to, instead of just constructing two divisors that are close together, to construct K divisors that are close together. <clears throat> okay, so it turns out this is basically a linear algebra problem, uh, merged with some complicated combinatorics. Okay, why is it a linear algebra problem? Uh, <clears throat> all right, so what we want to understand is when there are distinct divisors d1 up to dk, that uh, they, they all consist of primes between y and z, prime factors of our typical random integer n um, between y and z. And we want them to all be close together, or if I take logarithms, the logarithms to be close together. So I can view this as a linear condition on the set of log, on the logs of the prime factors of n between y and z, right? Because of course I can factor its di and its prime factors and then, right? So I, the log p think of log of p as unknown variables, okay? And then you have this linear system that is going to determine some of these random variables. Uh, and you want to, do this as efficiently as possible in order to pack k divisors close together. Okay, so the um, the first step for understanding um, the combinatorics, because this is a total mess now. Uh, in the uh, this is a this is a complete total mess because all the di's might interact with each other. In the multiplication table problem, in the generalized, the di's do not interact with each other because um, they are completely they consist of completely disjoint sets of primes, right? Because the product of d1, d2, up to dk minus one must divide n. So all the di's are completely disjoint. So the Venn, you have a very simple Venn diagram between the prime factors of the di's. But here, the Venn diagram can be a total uh, mess. And uh, we really need to understand uh, this combinatorial object if we want to make progress to this pro uh, towards this problem. All right, so for the Venn, the Venn diagram can be um, indexed by uh, these vectors omega in the unit cube, zero one, right? So, so for each omega, I consider the uh, capital D sub omega, 
which is the portion of, right? So it's the part of um, this divisor such that uh, this, these are the primes that appear exactly in the DIs such that omega is one and do not appear in the other ones. This, uh, this is how you partition the Venn diagram, you index everything. And uh, with this notation, um, I can now write uh, this vector uh, of logs of the DIs as um, this sum of, as this linear combination, where the linear combination is over this unit cube vectors and the coefficients are log of d omega. And the advantage when you do this is that um, the d omegas are of course co-prime by construction because they have only this joint set of prime factors. And um, they are also, um, yeah, so, so they sort of behave sort of independently of each other. <clears throat> well, uh, at least they're decoupled. Um, so then what do you need to understand? You need to understand um, what is the possible distribution of this uh, log di ice. And if you have a chance of detecting something that is very close to zero, mod one. And of course, the distribution of those log di ice will depend on uh, if, if you condition on, uh, you might then want to condition on the kind of configurations you're going to examine. And these configurations are going to be determined by the parts of the Venn diagram that are actually non-trivial. So maybe you only want to consider, uh, you only want to construct divisors whose Venn diagram uh, is not the full Venn diagram. Not everything is non-trivial, but only a small part of the Venn diagram is not trivial. Uh, so then you're gonna have geometric conditions and combinatorial conditions. And the geometric conditions are, go are going to arise by linear algebra by studying the structure of this uh, space, uh, whatever is spanned by these omegas uh, mod out by the constant vector one. Uh, and then the combinatorial conditions are going to come by the distribution of the prime factors of this, um, uh, of this D omegas. <clears throat> because this tells you how many such divisors you have. Okay, so it gets quite, it gets quite complicated and uh, I don't want to um, uh, explain in too much detail, but the most important, um, okay, so what is perhaps the easiest thing to explain is uh, the, the geometric constraints. So the geometric constraints are, um, in what kind of a box do these uh, vectors lie in? Uh, this log d1 up to log dk. In the previous cases where I was looking at um, the, the Martin bound construction or the k-dimensional multiplication table even, it was pretty obvious what was the box in which everything was lying in. But now it's not really that obvious. Uh, and one has to think a little bit about it. So what is the longest, right? So what is, how can, I, how can I understand what the box is? Well, I need to understand what is the longest possible dimension of uh, this vector. And the longest possible dimension coordinate of this vector would be whatever the projection is onto omega one, or some vector omega one chosen such that this log of d omega is as big as possible among all the choices I have. And uh, because uh, integers, log of the, log of the integer is basically controlled by log of its largest prime factor, uh, at least most of the time, uh, it suffices to look at, I'm gonna, um, it suffices to then basically look at whatever, whichever of this uh, Venn diagram has the largest divisor in it. <clears throat> and then what is the second longest dimension? Lo longest dimension? Uh, well, you look at omega two in omega, but you want to be linearly independent from the first one. So you remove everything that is already in the span of the first dimension. Um, and then you maximize, you look at the, whatever the largest prime is that among all of these things. And what this, assume you have constructed J, the J longest dimension, then the next one is going to be um, such that, uh, this should have been J plus one here. Um, 
So that it has the maxima uh, prime factor are more on linearly dependent uh, omegas that remain. Okay, so this is how you um, construct this omega one up to omega, uh, let's say R. And this also is a way to construct sort of a, a, a special basis of this vector space V. Um, and this basis tells you what is um, the geometric constraint that you need to uh, consider <clears throat> on the log of the, uh, sorry, on the kind of uh, linear, on this, on this kind of object. <clears throat> so that you then start understanding, then, you, you, then it's meaningful to ask, are they well distributed or not, right? This is, your measure of comparison is this product here that is determined uh, by this, uh, algorithm here <clears throat> and um, right so what ends up being important is then uh, whatever the size of these things are and um, to capture the size of uh, this biggest this should have been biggest prime factor uh, p of p plus of d of omega j i'm sorry that's a typo it's a pretty bad typo um, and then you end up having, um, right, so you have this filtration that is uh, of vector spaces that is caused by this process of constructing this basis in this iterative way. And you have this, uh, some thresholds that basically control how big your coordinates are. And then uh, you have some probability measures that I explained the role in a minute. Uh, so then the combinatorial construction of, const to, in order to get many divisors close to get k divisors close together, um, right? So what you do is that you look at um, so you look only on the Venn diagram um, that is in this uh, VR uh, in the top vector space, and uh, then you want all the all the prime factors uh, for the vectors in VJ to be controlled by this threshold, and um, then you, the mu j's control the distribution of the prime divisors of the d omegas for each of the, between each of the thresholds. Okay, so it's really, the connotation gets really complicated, um, but just, this is a rough idea. Um, you have this algorithm that produces this uh, vector spaces, and then you also want to control the combinatorics. And, um, right, so even all of this data, there are various, kind of constraints, geometric combinatorial constraints, one might consider that might that are sort of your enemy of that might suppress um, these vectors to lie in a, in a space of small dimension, um, of small measure. And uh, so these are all these lower dimensional constraints uh, that take up some specific shape. So I'm basically out of time, so I'm gonna skip this and um, but just to tell you that basically, just like in the k-dimensional k problem, now in a much more complicated way, we have um, all these possible in, all these possible lower dimensional constraints that we need to consider. Um, and these um, <clears throat> lower dimensional constraints are in terms of this threshold Cj, and in terms of um, the entropy. Uh, of these uh, measures I, I considered. And then what you have to do is to basically solve this, this, this quite complicated combinatorial optimization problem where you need to find the optimal value of C for which uh, such a system, such a choice of data exists. Okay, so, and what we proved is basically that uh, these are, this is equivalent to um, constructing K divisors close together using prime factors between thresholds like this. So you can find such a threshold C to construct prime K divisors close together if and only if a choice of um, vector spaces like this and threshold CJ and probability measures uh, exist that satisfy uh, these constraints. And um, right. Uh, yeah, so this is, so this is the theorem and then this is the abstract theorem. And then we needed to uh, exhibit a specific configuration that does better than the meyer tenenbaum construction. That can be seen, the meyer tenenbaum construction can be seen as a configuration 
when k is 2 to the r. And uh, we came up with something we call the binary flag uh, that does better. Okay, but uh, I'm out of time. Uh, and now it's getting quite technical. And I don't want to rush through all these really technical slides. So uh, thank you for your attention.